All right. So, state of the bridges now. That's that's basically it is. Right now you can see it. That's from the the wrecked pool. So generally that's a sentiment, right? So that that's what been asked, and I said like. Yeah, cool. I can talk louder. <laughs> so, jokes aside, jokes aside, I do have a presentation here. So, the general sentiment here with the, the bridges and the security is, no matter, you're going to get wrecked. The question is when. So, there are many reasons why. Bridges are required, but are they required in the current form factor? That's the question, right? So. I'm going to talk about more about our approach, how to take an asset from one chain to another. And that's what we call gateway. So gateways are not a bridge, but it just looks like and it functions like a bridge, but it's not a bridge. Um, it is a registry smart contracts that is coupled with sparse Merkle tree, index sparse Merkle tree that gives you um, a UTXO for you know you can mute that state a contract state on ethereum and you can prove it's an execution environment outside we're going to go deep into it a little bit i have to get used to it this um right so in a nutshell you can see that um, the bridges we are trying to redefining as a uth so um, a key difference here is we're talking about asset specific. So you got to do this for every asset that you're porting and to, to bring it back. That means redeeming that back, right? So ERC20 token. So how do we do this? We got a lot of data on Ethereum street transition. So we use a technique like, you know, commonly, same technique like a MapReduce function, just, you know, use a checkpoint that authenticated data source um, that will prove you have a number of tokens on, 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 on chain one. So you get that pre-compute and you can basically generate the path without even knowing the data. So you can basically give that proof and you know anyone, any untrusted verifier can verify to you. Uh, we'll get to that in a moment. So some people will very familiar with this. So the concept, this Merkle leaf that I'm going to over and over going through for all my talks, so just want to be very clear here. You can see this is the, how the proof is made and then you go to the destination execution environment, you only check the, val is the, the, the leaf is valid in the origin domain without even knowing the data. So then only go into fetch the data structure from the origin domain. So let's talk about how we do this for an ERC-20 and then we will dwell into a specific use case later on. So just to get some more clarity. Um, it's, a, it's a new approach. A lot of things we're saying is like pretty, you know, for, in a forward statement. So I, I need to say that. Um, we do have an implementation right now. I will go through that. So the ERC-20 will be, like as I said, we take this UTXO scheme with the registry smart contracts, that's something that we internally developed, um, and implemented currently with staked ETH on consensus layer. So you have validator balances on a consensus layer, and then you have execution layer, which is a completely different layer. We call it Ethereum, but it's a different layer. So we want to stream that the validator balances back to Ethereum, so the smart contracts can actually know what actually the validator balance is doing because it's wibbly wobbly. You know, you can get slashed and you have different balances. Um, so that's the current implementation that we've done. We're gonna walk through that. So the sparse Merkle tree will basically allow you to get a path for every state extensions. And you can, what, what this will allow you to do is like, you have a domain A, let it call, uh, it, let's say it's an Ethereum, you can extend to N domains. You can do it in Arbitrum, you can do it to, to Optimism, you can do it to any, any arbitrary execution environments. We treat everything outside of Ethereum as an execution environment, right? Because your, your asset is the base asset is sitting on the, the first domain. 
and then this, the execution environment you can go and mint the tokens based on the tokens extended from the domain A and it always matches the supply. The, the, the preserve of supply is always maintained. So no tokens will never get minted out of thin air. And you know, the Merkle tree like you never fill the last leaf. Thanks for RV. You know, saying that they did a formal verification of this for Ethereum deposit contracts. So we take that from there. So here, simply going through a use case how we do it, you can see that we're porting a state from Ethereum, let's say to, to optimism. You can have like an S3 has been supported with a value of E0. And the accumulator index, so accumulator index, accumulator I always have an index. It's an index boss Merkle tree. It comes with an index and a hash. And the, the contract also proves uh, have another index as called the deposit count. So it's been taken to, to optimism and S3, and you can always get this kind of leave on this false Merkle tree. And the, the whole logic is in the contract. So there is no specific Merkle tree exists as it is. You, can, you need to reconstruct it. So this is a case study that we're doing now. So this is DETH. So for those who don't know the DETH, is a derivative of stake D that I mentioned with the stake hash. It's our protocol we launched like about two weeks ago to the mainnet after 17 months of testing um, in, in Ethereum. So currently it will allow you to take the DETH from consensus layer as a validator balance BLS key mapped into, into Ethereum and then the DETH will be allow you to take to the optimism. So just to give you some clarity here, the DETH is the ETH that is a kind of a protected deposit, so it will never goes down. So this is this will allow us to, to onboard a lot of mainstream users to, to be in the Ethereum staking environment. So they never see the, the balance goes down, right? So Ethereum has two revenue base. One is the inflation yield, is an, another one is the tips and other things are coming from the node running that, that you collect from the few recipient address. So the lead is have an exclusive right to the inflation yield. So you can see that the state from the say leads registry is a contract that in the stake house that's dealing with all the D that's minted and that sits on Ethereum and then it's getting extended to, to optimism. We have a testnet right now. Um, so this is our implementation you can send to the optimism and then you know the save it registry has a bunch of indexes. So the index is like a bundle of validators. So every validator has an effective balance maximum of 32 ETH. So you just bundle it and you can have like, you know, 10 validators, 100 validators per index. So gateway index is a kind of an index when you send a validator balance, it just freeze. You cannot spend any more that ETH on Ethereum, right? You can only, and you also assign a domain there. So you can go to optimism here. In this case, we specify the domain as an optimism. You can, you're extending that to optimism and the gateway does allow you to, to go and do it. So you can see the number 19, index number 19 has a 48.2 ETH and, and you can see the mintable balance and the frozen balance. So frozen is only 24.2 has been sent to the gateway as frozen, the rest of the 24 is still on Ethereum and has been extended and then it just got minted on, it, on optimism. And it's all done by user itself. There is no intermediary in between. You can have intermediaries, but a user could be an individual, you know, individual person, or it could be a protocol, right? So, why this is possible? Because you know we have this registry smart contracts actually gives you two things: the correctness. If there is a state that's been extended as an S prime. You know, you can basically verify with an untrusted tester um, through this Merkle root and a hash, and you can always verify that. Um, the verification is like, you know, uh, it's, it's a persistent data structure and it's immutable. So no matter, even if you freeze the index tomorrow, you can come back and you can always verify, you know, what has been extended by the registry. We'll get into that in a moment in later slides. And also, you know, to skip the slide, but it also preserve the order. The ordering is the first in first serve, so you never go back, you know. And then, you know, everyone has been given like, you know, a leaf is inserted every transaction goes into the index. So, why this is important? 
we all use bridges for some reason, but bridges are like very heavy, high capital requirement is needed. So it's 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 very heavy. It's um, you need to have you know the liquidity on the boat and. You have counterparty risk because you're always giving a tokens to an intermediary and then you lose that. Here, a single extender can process about 4.2 billion, you know, give or take about you know, 232, that's the, the whole accumulator. So you can do that 4.2 billion transaction per to, to Optimism or another 4.2 to, to Arbitrum. And then once that has been filled, then you can start a new one. So it's, it's very easy to do that. and. Let's say if you want to do about hmm, hundreds of millions of transactions for payment services, right? If you want to send it for a billion dollar of transaction, need to be moved around in multiple environment. You don't really have to have any liquidity problems there. The only cost is the verification, you know, cost. That's very easy to do it in a call, call, call an um, RPC endpoint, or you can do it yourself if you can reconstruct the the the, 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 um, the tree. So. I say that, do you want to buy postage stamps like every time that you want to pay or just say, have an email and send like 10,000 emails per, per month, which is, just want to give an analogous view. And how do we do this in a, in a more, at a scale you have like more untrusted verifiers comes here, like, you know, a, a partially blind signature scheme will allow you to, to verify it very simply. So that's like, you know, that's been widely used. Um, and we, if we get that kind of an operators, as many operators comes, the, u the cost to the user to bridge a tokens from a domain to another domain, from Ethereum to Arbitrum, again, there's, there shouldn't be a need for it to go to a bridge guy and liquidity. So Alice goes here and I have 100 token, go to Optimism Maui and say that, hey, I have 100 token. Only thing it costs like about maybe 10 cents at this, but at a scale it will be zero because everyone is competing for it. Right. So we talked about we're taking assets to one chain to another. Would that solve the problem with the bridges? That's not the only thing is happening. If the bridges goes down, it just burns money all the time, right? So again, this is this is a nice thing. So about $60 billion has been you know, lost, about $2 billion, that's a recourse that you got it. So it's a good business if you're getting that one, it's a $60, $60 billion who ever gets on the other end. And you can see that it's going up from 2021, the Poly Network bridge hacked to up until the Binance one. So even if you're trusting the chain guy, the bridge is owned by the chain itself, it's going to go down. So there's no matter which bridge you're using, it's gonna go down. So how do we solve that problem? And what are the issues there? Why the recourse matters, right? So as Vitalik said, like, you know, you still need a base data available to data layer to get your security. And that's why we take the Ethereum, I said, like in the domain A, and to take all the other domains. Um, so why the bridges, the recourse is very hard now, because there's no rage quit per se. Once you're given the assets, you cannot just come back and say, you know, I rage quit, I want to get my asset back. That's not possible if something happens. And if something happens, there's no clear path of reconciling the liability. So that means, you, you have, put it simple, you have a terrible option now, do I have a better have an option before that? I can go back to it. So there's no such thing as this. Um, you know, and the second order effect, what we are seeing now, is very different from the asset that has been ported. So for example, the Nomad Bridge was really interesting mechanism they did, but it allowed a lot of assets to be get ported to a lot of other environments like Moonbeam and other things. Covalent is a token just lost about 13%. So that's a governance token. So it's not only about the assets, it's about the the nature of the assets is that in governance, then there's a protocol is in the problem. So there could be governance attack can happen. So this could go into really cascading. And you know, the bridges, the contagion within the bridges is not limited to one environment, to all the environment, right? The, whatever the bridges is serving. 
And also, right now, there is no specific way to say that hackers or you know how you lose money. The Nomad just just showed us that you can have like you know monkey see monkey do thing kind of stuff. Like people just copy paste it because you get alerted when the bytecode is different. And you know the MEV guys just do it, and someone will see it, and they just copy paste and do it. And so you have this kind of nomad hackers. You don't really need to have an expert uh, level of knowledge to do get into it. And they're not really hackers in any way. They're just trying to get some money. So how do we solve this? So this is something that we're trying to approach from a, a point. We can make monitoring more easy speed and simplicity right monitoring is easy if you are relying on the data points from the chain itself so an on-chain data in the gateway is like you know you can monitor what happens so you can write the rules if um, an execution transaction execution has happened the the, the 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 preservation of supply is being guaranteed or not and um, this is something that we try to implement on the stakehouse, like you know, when you take an um, a save ETH registry, is deed is mended, is the save ETH registry is okay, when they do the balance report, if something happened, then it will just goes into a tri-state, like in a green, amber, or red. Um, we have done some, some work, and RV has um, written some nice rules over there, so kudos there. So, something that will make everyone to understand what's going on behind the scene, and you know, make it human readable. And the master registry that I just mentioned before, the master registry in Ethereum has all the supply. So let's say you have three domains of supply, you extend it, right? And then you have the master registries on Ethereum, so you have Arbitrum, Optimism, and Boba. All the balances will actually, you know, meet all the frozen balances on Ethereum, so the preservation of supply. Um, and the contagion risk is limited to a specific asset to a specific environment that has been extended, not to the all the environment, all to the end. So even if the even if something goes down with the optimism, you have let's say about oh 10,000 ETH is there. That's only limited to that 10,000 ETH here, not to other gateways, and not to not to the other domains that you extended. So you can just basically reconcile it. Um, you can basic, and it also the registry will reject any any kind of inflated tokens as an orphan balance. So. Let's say you have optimism, um, optimistic verification. That's you know they, they have this. Um, they, you put up a, a challenge and it just got approved, and you try to mint a unwound state transition to back and say mint a D. It will treat automatically as an orphan balance because the CV the registry in in um, in the main chain will never allow you to redeem for that. So it's not about the peg. It's it's about the redeemability of the assets on the on the on the on the other environment. Right, so how do we approach this? Our case, we did for the stakeouts to a very generic ERC20 package that anyone can download and upgrade an ERC20 for multi-chain. And that's something that we want to do in the next, in a few weeks, we're working on it. So this is a work in progress. Um, you have two kind of ERC20s. A vanilla tokens like you know you want to do 10 tokens taking from domain A to domain B and then you have kind of dynamic balances like LP shares now or something or in any Uniswap so what we have shown I've you know what I shown there here for the slides D this kind of a dynamic balance it, it can go up so uh, with the RC20 with the registry you can extend to to any arbitrary execution, non EVM environment, doesn't matter. Because you always have this kind of extensions, you know, verify and preserve the, the, the supply. Um, so we're trying to upgrade this in such a way you can prove it with property tests and additional some toolings that is give you some kind of a formal um, formal model. Um, so you can verify that before you're executing this. So, in, in the future, we, we believe every ERC20 can just upgrade to a multi-chain and extend it and offer this kind of nice UX and safer path for users to extend their token balances and then you know, use it regardless. So the current thing that we're trying to do is like we are working, we're working with um, you know, Mulian team 
they're trying to to set up some kind of um, you know tighten rules for uh, the first early generalized rules for the the ERC20 multi chain upgraded and you know like an open Zeppelin library we give it and they, they can just run that using Sotora cloud and you get the basic properties that's formal like you know what's the logic what's a is a is a you know the solvency rules are correct you know using the ghost you can just go and check all the leaves in the in the Merkle trees and also like you know how this has been extended and where it has been extended so this kind of things will actually allow you to anyone who want to execute it before that you use a tool and you get some kind of a you know a better guarantees you know when you when you want to you know, extend your uh, extend your balances um, and then there's additional things that we're trying to do with registries is an MEV resistance, like you can basically try to bring blind swap using, um, um, you know, blind signatures. I'm not saying that's completely going to raise MEV, but it's just some kind of resistance that you can do it. Um, again, going forward, like in the next five to six months, we will we will release more of these packages. Currently, it's only for us, the DE, but in the, in the next three to five, know, five to six weeks, we'll, we, we will release it. Um, going forward, we want to take this to a next level. So right now, we're just only saying that Ethereum tokens. What if we can combine? So if you look at the DeFi, it's only about like you know ERC20, most of ERC20, ERC721. We want to extend the support to ERC11, you know, um, five five, and combine it so you can offload an arbitrary logic from a protocol to an execution environment liquidations, you know, onboarding <laughs> users, you know, for 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 Aave or you know MakerDAO kind of protocols or metaverse, or you can take so you're offloading you're offloading the execution stress from the Ethereum to, to a data availability um, or any other execution environment like rollups, but you can still get the guarantees. So in the long run we try to try to get this kind of reusability of the liquidity that not going through any middleman. Um, so in a way that every dollar you're going through the DeFi and to be reused in multiple ways, you can, you can get um, a much more composable multi-team strategies. That's it. That's, that's our talk. It's very informal in a formal setup. So we just want to go for a lightweight. Any questions? I'm happy to answer it.